going to start the recording. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lev. I'm the executive director at the Boulder JCC. And I know that we're going to have more people join um, as well as many people will see this um, via video. The, the goal of today is all about helping the helpers. And all of us right now in Boulder County, as well as other places in the country, are trying to figure out ways in which we can connect with others and also help. Um, and one of the biggest things that we're doing is connecting with people individually, one-on-one -on -one, and having conversations. And we recognize sometimes it's hard to find the right words and, and understand how to connect with people on an individual level when such tragedy and trauma has happened in people's lives. And so um, in partnership with the uh, with JCC Association and um, the incredible work of J-Response, which um, I will have them explain um, J-Response is uh, the disaster response um, arm of uh, JCC Association. We're, we have a, a program that we did for our staff that we're now bringing to the community. And I, I'm honored to be able to have both Mark Young, who's the director of J Response at JCC Association, as well as Jenny Schwartz, who's the director of helping for, for the Jewish for good at the Levin JCC in Durham, North Carolina, um, be with us to be able to teach us and, and learn with us. This, this time is really not easy for everyone here in Boulder County. And it, at, you know, I was asked the other day, uh, what makes this different than other um, tragedies that we've dealt with because we have dealt with so many in our community and each one is brings a unique um, challenge. And this one in particular is that every single person I talk to is connected in some ways, whether that's for, through school, through work, um, through personal connection, through family friend, through family member, to someone who lost a home or was displaced or still is displaced. And because of the extent of this, so many of the interactions we're having uh, are need context, and we 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 want to learn how to best communicate with one another. So I'm 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 honored that we've been able to work with JCC Association and J Response to be able to bring this to our community. Um, and I'm going to pass over uh, to Mark and Jenny and give my gratitude to Nancy Lipsy, our our senior director of programs, who's helped put this together. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Mark Young. I am the director of J-Response at JCC Association. Uh, I'm zooming in from Westchester County, New York, just north of New York City. Um, and you see also in the spotlight, Jenny, you can introduce yourself for a quick second if you want. I'm Jenny Schwartz. I'm the director of helping at Jewish for Good in uh, Durham, North Carolina, and uh, went through the J-Response training last year. I was uh, a clinical social worker as well. Correct. Uh, and, and also a, a certified trainer of mental health first aid. So I'm so pleased that you're joining us, Jenny. And we are honored uh, to be with you for this hour. We are, of course, uh, been thinking about you and the Boulder community ever since December 30th. Our hearts go out. And we hope that this time, however brief, could be beneficial for you, both as you have experienced the last couple I'm of weeks. I'm going to go in the kitchen and listen and, to this. And as you support uh, the community that you are serving. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, interactive pieces towards the beginning, and then it's a, a lot of me sharing information. Um, should you have a question at any point, you can put it in the chat, or you can unmute yourself, um, and I will turn to Jenny uh, to respond to those questions in real time. We are here for you. We want to make sure this hour is as beneficial for you as possible. So at any point, if you have a question or a comment or need clarification, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to ask and interrupt. Uh, so with that, I am going to share my screen. I'll primarily, if not exclusively, have the screen sharing on, on PowerPoint. Um, and as Jonathan spoke about, this is really about helping the helpers, supporting our community in a time of crisis, and want to uh, emphasize uh, what Jonathan mentioned, that we're helping the helpers but to a degree um, uh, everyone on this call, certainly everyone in Boulder on this call, has also been some uh, to a degree impacted as well. So we're going to address that um, throughout our uh, training as well. So our agenda. Um, we're going to learn how to provide initial meaningful relief um, in these early days and weeks uh, since the fires of December 30th through techniques of mental health and psychological first aid. 
and we will define both of those terms. Uh, we'll define terms throughout the hour, and if there's questions, again, uh, make sure that uh, you let us know so we can address them. Uh, these skills include how to listen non-judgmentally or non-judgmental listening, how do we provide reassurance and information um, and try to stay away from providing advice, and we'll show examples of that, and how we can encourage individuals that we engage with to either employ self-help strategies or seek professional help as and when needed uh, so they can go towards this road of what we'll talk about called post-traumatic growth, that though this trauma has hit and there's a lot of negative components to it, uh, how might that get to a positive place, not immediately, but over time. Uh, so that's really gonna be our frame and our context for our discussion. Um, we'll also discuss what we should not do. And we're saying this now at the very beginning, we'll reiterate at the end. The first role for us as we respond to crises, mental health first aiders, if you will, is to do no harm. Uh, we wanna make sure that as we try to help, we don't make it worse. And there are things that we wanna avoid saying or doing. So if nothing else, we want to at least, you know, stay on the plane that folks are in. So we're gonna talk a, a little bit about do no harm throughout the hour as well. Um, and then, as time pending and as even after this hour, we are here for you to reflect on these skills as you navigate supporting the Boulder JCC community and the broader Boulder community um, in the time ahead. I will add that we're gonna be taking elements from both psychological and mental health first aid. This is not a full certified training. The full certified training that actually Jenny conducts is a full eight hours. So if you're interested in the full training to be a mental health first aid certified individual, uh, we can give you resources to do the full eight hours. This is laying those principles because you're in this work right now and we want you to have uh, tools and skills at the ready because you're having these conversations uh, inevitably. So um, Jonathan mentioned that uh, we come from JCC Association and J-Response. I just want to take a minute to define and share a little bit about JCC Association and J-Response so you know where we're coming from and then we'll dig into the content. For those that are unfamiliar, uh, JCC Association, our, our mission is to lead and connect the JCC movement, advancing and enriching North American Jewish life. And just a little bit about our organization. We're based in New York, but we have staff all over the continent. Um, we have 1.5 million people coming through our JCCs every week. That's a pre-pandemic number, but between real and virtual, we imagine that's still very much close to that number between our 171 Jewish community centers and Jewish community camps, including the Boulder JCC. And we are the organization is, as the umbrella, as the supporter of the entire movement and all the JCCs in these communities. Um, that boasts 12,000 full-time professionals and up to 41,000 part-time and seasonal professionals. Um, and by supporting them in programs like J Response and in many other programs that we do and services together, we enhance and strengthen Jewish life throughout North America. So J Response is just one example of how we harness this platform of supporting JCCs and uh, leading JCCs throughout the continent. Um, and that's where uh, we come from. So uh, a, a tiny bit about J Response. J Response was actually started in 2018 after the hurricane that hit Harvey, uh, after Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston, uh, pardon me, that um, it was realized that the greatest asset that JCCs have to support each other and to support folks after crisis is our people, is our talent, is folks like Jenny um, that can go to communities, either real or virtual, and provide support, whether that's extra hands on deck, um, whether that's replacing staff or being there for the community or providing social and emotional care. And this is maybe one example of how we can provide at least virtually social and emotional care or train the people on the ground to provide that care. We revolve around four pillars, readiness, relief, recovery, and resilience. You'll see relief in bold because this training is very much around the idea of relief. How do we provide support for people in those initial weeks uh, after a crisis? But as you'll engage in this content, um, relief helps aid in recovery, that long-term uh, recovery after a crisis. And these, these skills also help build resilience. And these skills also help prepare us for the inevitable future crises and current crises that we're also navigating. Of course, the wildfires came in the context of uh, the third calendar year of COVID and 
the daily crisis that people deal with as well. So hopefully these skills really reflect all of the R's of J-Response, readiness, relief, recovery, and resilience. And we have hundreds of J-Responders trained at JCCs throughout the continent, including in Boulder. So uh, a bit of an interactive piece. I encourage you to participate. And if you also just want to listen, that is OK, too. Um, a, a bit of an orienter and also a tool for you to use. This is what we call the spiritual fitness guide. It's actually used uh, in uh, working with uh, Jewish chaplains who work with Jewish military veterans in the military, in Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. And they often show them this guide um, you know, after challenging situations, after crises, and they ask, how are you feeling? What color um, speaks to how you're navigating and your feelings right now? And you can see very briefly how they define fit, engaged in life's meaning and purpose, hopeful about the future, make sound moral decisions, and how that changes when you get to a position of being stressed or when you get to a position of being depleted. And not depleted of like, you know, I had a, I'm, I'm tired today, you know, I ran around with the kids, I'm depleted. That's obviously a, a fair and, you know, decent thing to respond to. But this depleted is, you know, navigating really traumatic, um, challenging times and seeing how that can affect us. And of course, drained. So I invite you, if you wish, in the chat to share where you might be right now. And if you are okay sharing it with everyone, you can share with everyone. If you want to put it in the chat and just find my name, Mark S. Young, and just send it to me um, so it's uh, confidential, you're welcome to do that. Uh, and you're also welcome to just you know, write it down for yourself or think to yourself. So I'll give folks you know, just a, a few seconds or so you can go to the chat and share, are you feeling fit? Are you feeling stressed? Are you feeling depleted? Are you feeling drained? You can definitely be, be between two colors. You can be a little bit of everything. So I'm seeing a few come in, some just to me and some to the whole group. I'm seeing stressed, I'm seeing depleted. I'm seeing sometimes in between two colors. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for uh, um, opening up where you might be right now. Um, why is this important? As we try to help those in our community, this might be a tool that we might engage with people. If someone's coming into the JCC or if you're meeting someone in the community that you know has been impacted and they don't really know the words or you don't really have the words to even start a conversation, you could just say, hey, how are you feeling right now? And they might look at this and they might share, you know, I'm feeling really stressed or I'm feeling depleted. What does this mean for us? If someone is feeling fit and even if they've just dealt with a a huge trauma like losing their home or otherwise being impacted by the fires, people can still feel fit and still feel traumatized. But if someone's feeling fit or even if someone's feeling stressed, that is opportunities for them to encourage their own self-help strategies, um, taking walks, deep breaths, meditation, we could talk more about those strategies later, and having support, you can see we're using their J-response language as a J-responder, as someone who's not necessarily um, you know, a licensed medical professional, but someone, a friend, a colleague, the folks in this, in this Zoom that can be there for them and to be a presence. When someone's fit or stressed or maybe stressed to depleted, that's where we're going to use this work of mental health and psychological first aid. If folks are feeling particularly depleted or drained, that really is an indication to us that as much as we can have that initial conversation with them, their best course of action is to encourage them to see a licensed medical or a licensed counselor professional or a clergy. I recognize we may have some clergy on this call um, or other professional support that just like if you think a physical first aider, right, we might be equipped to put on the band aid or help people out when they first get a cut. Um, but we're not the medical doctor that's going to provide more intensive care if, ne if needed. Same idea here. So a spiritual fitness guide too. remember, we're thinking about folks, mental and spiritual self. That perhaps felt a bit clinical. So I wanted to provide one other tool at the beginning here called the mood meter, which comes out of the Yale school that does a wonderful work in social and emotional learning. You can see the various moods that are in front of you right now. Um, just to orient you, you see moods that are in the green, which if you take a look at that is typically folks or typically moods that are um, lower energy, but generally more positive. Uh, the yellow to the right is uh, 
more high energy and also positive to the red going clockwise uh, is high energy but often feeling negative feelings or you know not so positive feelings and blue is low energy and not so positive so i encourage you in the chat either just to myself or to the whole group what mood or color or what moods are you feeling right at this moment at you know just after 2 p.m your time on january 11th um, so uh, you can think about it for uh, a second or two and if you feel comfortable putting in the chat you can put your moods um, often it's asked, can I put more than one? You absolutely could put more than one. Um, we are complex individuals, not even during times of crisis, but especially during times of trauma and post-trauma. So if you're feeling several of the words that you're seeing in front of you, um, you can feel free to put those moods or just think about where you might be right now. And again, any mood to feel is okay. It's, it comes without judgment. Excellent. So green and some yellow, some yellow and some red. These tools, whether it's sharing someone, where are you on the mood meter or where are, or are you on the spiritual fitness guide? They're both helpful for us because we are dealing with this trauma too, to a degree, and maybe to a significant degree or not significant degree, depending on how you've experienced it and how you can mention that. So even just to check in with yourself using these tools gives yourself a little resilience, gives yourself a little relief, which puts you in better position to provide support to someone else, right? You wanna put out your own oxygen mask on first and then offer assistance. You wanna make sure that you're in a, as okay of a place as you can be as you engage with others. And it's also a great tool to check in with others because then it helps orient them to see how they feel. Oftentimes during uh, experiencing post-trauma and crisis, it's harder to do the easier things, including sharing how they're feeling. They may not have the words, these are tools that help them give them the words, help them start a conversation, help orient how you can help them. And I have to reiterate that if someone really feels significantly um, in the depleted or drained category to the left of your screen, then that's an indication, okay, how can I encourage them to see professional support beyond my conversations with them? So thank you for engaging in kind of these initial conversations. Again, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat um, and uh, Jenny will address them either in the chat or we'll, we'll start a conversation um, and we can send this whole slide deck so you have these tools with you. So in what roles might we provide relief? Do we have to be in a specific role? I imagine you may see yourself in one or more than one of these categories, parent, guardian, grandparent, child, sibling, relative, a professional peer or colleague, manager or supervisee, professional for your community, uh, a friend and a friendly neighbor, I would add here as well. Um, if you're a caring and empathetic individual who can be a presence for others and are willing and uh, able to have conversations with others or even just be present for them and know that you might be called upon to notice and observe, then you can provide relief. Um, and, unless you might be otherwise, uh, we're not assuming that you're licensed medical or health professionals or clergy. If at any point someone needs more than first aid help, they're in that depleted or drained category, for example, encourage them to seek professional support. So we all can do this work and we're probably all thrusted into this work in some way, given the, the uh, last couple of weeks. Uh, this is also an orienter. How can mental health first aid or psychological first aid help? Well. It can help even before a crisis hits. If we were able to listen non-judgmentally with each other and support each other, that's a form of prevention, a form of resilience building and readiness. But after a crisis, in the first days and weeks after a crisis, we're typically in the green, right? We've experienced the trauma or those that we're supporting has to have experienced the trauma. And the longer we go since that, it could get harder and harder and harder. Sometimes we think it might get easier and easier and easier, but sometimes it gets harder and harder and harder. So as folks become unwell, to use the terminology on the screen, our initial conversation with them, our checking in with them, our being physically present with them could help them on the road to getting treatment or further conversations or doing the self-help work or a combination of those things so they can be recovering and on a positive path as opposed to a negative path. So this can work in prevention and early intervention and in treatment. I would say generally speaking, we're kind of in this position of early intervention post the fires. Um, and again, you know, trauma comes on top of trauma, right? We're navigating COVID at the same time and 
uh, other other crises that are that are potentially happening in people's lives. So that's an orienter as well. Um, where is this information coming from that we're sharing with you? Two main sources. One is the National Council for Mental Well-Being, formerly known as the National Council for Behavior and Mental Health. They um, conduct and design the mental health first aid trainings that we'll be drawing from. And again, my colleague Jenny on the call is a certified trainer. Um, so if you would do the full training, that would be through them. Um, and you see to the right, ISRAID. ISRAID is a signature initial partner of J-Response. They are the organization, international organization based out of Israel that provides uh, physical and psychological support to communities in disaster worldwide. So they are in Haiti, they are in Lesbos, Greece, um, they've been all over the place through COVID, they've been um, in so many different places, and they've come here to the States, uh, to Houston, uh, uh, to Kentucky, um, to uh, various places. So they really talk about the, the language of psychological first aid and um, the National Council of Mental Wellbeing talks about mental health first aid. Uh, we'll talk about those differences in a moment. So what are our goals when providing relief? Um, our goal is not to fix them. Um, our goal is really just to reduce the initial distress caused by traumatic events and to foster the short and long-term adaptive functioning and coping so they can move forward. Um, mental health first aid is typically, you know, generally if people are dealing with a mental health crisis, whether it's based on a natural disaster or not, psychological first aid is much more specific to people experience a disruptive event, you know, the December 30th wildfires as a prime example. So that's, you know, we're kind of toggling between one and both because they're both relevant, but in this case, we, we're really thinking about psychological first aid. Um, we can think about our objectives through three guiding principles. If I'm engaging with someone, how am I restoring their feelings of safety? Because they may feel unsafe right now because they don't have a home that they had a few weeks ago. How do we reduce their stress during an inevitably stressful time? And how do we regulate emotions? So what we're going to be talking about for the balance of the session is how we can employ our empathetic selves to help them do that and to help them get there or to help them on the road to there. Um, help them employ adaptive behaviors. They're going to figure out coping and flexibility. That's our goal here too. And help strengthen and support the resources and resilience that are already present. Um, we can be a connector, a convener to Jewish Family Services or another partner um, that helps them navigate insurance or whatever they're dealing with right now. Um, again, it's sometimes hardest to do the things we're most used to doing during times of challenge. So how do we help people get to the things that they need? Because it's, it's harder to do the easier things, harder to do the obvious things during times of challenge and stress. Um, I want to recognize that I'm just looking at my PowerPoint and I'm not always seeing people's faces. So if you do have a question, if you do have a comment, feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to continue on. Um, it's such a wonderful group to be with. So um, the, the key acronym that uh, Mental Health First Aid uses in providing relief is ALGE, A-L-G-E-E. -E. And you see in bold the L and the G, which we're going to primarily focus on, but it's important that we uh, navigate um, A. And we're not going to give A enough time right now, because that's for the full training. But it's important that we assess um, for risk. If we are engaging with somebody and they really don't look, um, if they really don't seem, um, well, hold on for one, one, one. Well, I can, while Mark is doing that, I can take over. So yeah, you want to assess for risk of suicide or harm on Mark's back. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Jenny. I just needed to um, take a very quick moment. I'm back. Um, assess for uh, risk of suicide or harm. Um, if you are engaging with somebody or you're, you're noticing anything, you are noticing something. If you feel that you need to tell somebody else, then you should tell somebody else what you're noticing. Um, and it's important to reiterate that we're not in this business of providing relief for loan. Right? You're part of a team, you're part of a community, you're part of friends, you're part of other colleagues that you don't, it's not your responsibility to take care of this person, but if it's your, it is your responsibility, or you can take it upon yourself, if you see someone that's really not in the best way, 
to connect them or tell somebody else, hey, maybe we should check on, check on Jenny. That's, that I think is the number one thing to say here. You have eyes, if you see something, say something. Um, there's much more to say about that, but I wanna focus the balance of our time specifically on listening non-judgmentally and giving reassurance and information because this training is really about, well, what do we say once we start to have those conversations? What do I want to say to be helpful and not, not helpful? So we're gonna be focusing on LNG, but we will be spending a, a tiny bit of time on encouraging appropriate professional help, not telling them to go, but say, hey, did you think about engaging with someone from JFS or et cetera? And encouraging self-help strategies, either ones that they feel uh, already connected to or ones that you can suggest. Um, Jenny, I will give you an extra minute if you think there's more I should say, we should say on assess for risk or suicide or harm before we go on. Um, no, I just think that, um, yeah, because there's a lot of training on that. I don't want to overwhelm people today. So I think, um, yeah, just what Mark said, if you see something, say something. And I think for people that can be very overwhelming and just know, I think that you have, um, if you're not comfortable, you have a Jewish family services there, correct? Or, or places that you can refer people to so that you don't have to take it on yourself. I think that that can be overwhelming. But um, to go into that too much, I think maybe too much for today. Thank you, Jenny, I appreciate it. Um, so we're gonna go on and we're gonna talk specifically about listening non-judgmentally. And again, why do we focus on this listening non-judgmentally and this LG um, protocol? We do this because we want to listen to people who wish to share their stories and emotions. People react differently to disasters and there is no right or wrong way to feel. The whole Boulder community may have experienced December 30th, but every individual story is different. So we can't assume that my neighbor down the street, whether their experience, at least from the outside, was the same as mine or not, experienced this emotionally differently than we did. We all experience this differently because we're all different people. We're coming with different stories to this. So there's no right or wrong way to feel. And we ought to be friendly and compassionate, even if people are being difficult. And we can imagine navigating uh, feelings of trauma and post-trauma that we're not going to be the selves that we expect to be, at least as we were previous. So we, as the helpers, need to remain friendly and compassionate, even if people are being difficult, and you'll see in an upcoming slide, because it's not about us, it's about them. When we're in these interactions with our friends, our colleagues, our peers who are navigating um, really difficult times, how can our focus be on them and focus ourselves on being friendly and compassionate? So that's the why, why to listen non-judgmentally. How do we do it? How do we listen non-judgmentally? And let me say it right at the outset, listening non-judgmentally is hard. It's hard because we are wired to make judgments. <laughs> um, sometimes we need to make judgments in order just to navigate our day, but it's, it's hard to not be judgmental, even if we don't consider ourselves to be judgmental. So how do we do that? How do we effectively communicate? Um, a good reminder as you're walking down the street and may engage in these conversations is to remember your B's, remember your B-E, and that is be genuine and respectful. Be careful about using slang. Any terminology that might offend or even just not communicate what you want to say, what you want to share to those you are engaging with. To be comfortable with silence. Sometimes the best mental health first aid is not just, is just not saying anything or not say much and just be present. To navigate trauma, and I, I just want to be very sensitive to here, you, we've, everyone in Boulder has been navigating some level of trauma right now. Um, sometimes the best thing is to feel you're with somebody and not to feel lonely, which is a, a natural feeling to feel post a trauma. So just being present, sometimes we don't have to say anything and you're doing, a, you're doing help, you're, you're, you're being of help. Um, be in the present with whom without comparisons to you, especially hard because you're also in a situation, it's not as if you have flown in from a different city to provide support, you are of the community, but how as much as possible you can communicate by making it about that person's story, narrative experience and not yours. Uh, aware that the person's feelings are very real, no matter what those feelings are. Accepting them, even though you may not agree. They may say something that could feel categorically wrong. You can't disagree with someone's feelings though. 
um, those feelings are those feelings. Um, uh, be aware of your body language and facial expressions. Um, calm, smiling, um, focused towards them. Um, notice that you are communicating even if you are not saying. So what do you want to communicate? You want to communicate openness in your, in your expressions to them in your body language. And being positive with your feedback. Um, always using positive language as much as possible. So the what of, uh, of listening, nod judgmentally. Use I statements. State non judgmentally what you have noticed. You can talk, it's not about you, but you can say, you know, I notice um, X, you know, X or Y. I, I notice, um, you know, how, how, how I've seen you today. Um, I, I notice that you might not, you know, you've shared with me that you are, you know, feeling in this mood right now. You can share your observations in a way that doesn't make it that they have to own it, right? It's just using I statements. Ask questions you can share. Have you gone through tough times before? How have you been today? Um, tell me about your last couple of days. What are you navigating? But if people don't want to talk, that's okay. Your job is not to make them talk. Your job is to listen if they want to share. And if not, to be physically present. And if they say, hey, you know, I really appreciate you reaching out. I, I'm not in the position to talk right now or be with anyone right now. As long as you feel that they're not at any risks to themselves, then that's okay too. We don't want to, we want to be helpful, but if they really don't want our help at that moment, then that's a cue to us uh, not to push. Realize it may be a relief for the person to talk about how she, he, or they feel, even if they're feeling very negative feelings, right? We might feel, oh, they're sharing how depressed they are or how upset they are, how frustrated they are. I'm just making them feel worse by sharing how they feel. You're probably actually making them feel better. You're, right, you're taking those feelings and you're taking them out and just sharing can help them feel better as well. So you're doing actually very good work if that happens. Remember, it's about them, not you, uh, something we intentionally say several times throughout this conversation because their experiences are not the same as yours, their perspective is not the same as yours, their culture may not be the same as yours, they need our empathy, so we need to try to put ourselves in their shoes, so taking ourselves out of our shoes as much as possible. Um, and they may use language that makes you feel uncomfortable, um, which, again, it's about them, it's not about us. So as much as we can you know, be okay with that, we should be okay with that. Obviously, if someone is making you feel very, very uncomfortable, that you don't feel like you are helpful here, if they're, if they're saying something that is offensive, to you, you know, especially more than once, like you are not also not forced to stay either. Um, so that's the listening non judgmentally piece. Um, and I recognize we, we went through that fairly quickly. So if there are questions, please um, raise your virtual hand, unmute, put it in the chat, etc. Listening is really part one of this two parter. Um, if we are going to share, beyond asking questions, we have to make sure that it's in the category of reassurance and information and not advice. And I'm gonna show examples, I believe, on the next slide. But what does reassurance and information look like? It's being prepared to have realistic expectations and offer consistent emotional support. We wanna give the person hope. We wanna provide practical help, but not tell them what to do. Provide information and acknowledge the limits of what you can do. I'm here to, um, help you get to the resources that you need. I'm here to be a physical presence for you. I'm here to hear your stories if you want to hear, if you want to share them. I'm here just to be a friend. Um, I'm not here to, to fix and I'm not here to tell you what to do. And I'm not a licensed medical professional, so I'm not doing that work either, but I can help you get there. Uh, so be cautious not to. It's kind of the inverse, but so important to, to, to talk out, to, to raise up. Um, do not make promises you can't keep. You may want to feel in the moment, you know, I'm going to check on you every day at 12 o'clock just to see how you are. Unless, first of all, they may, may not want that. And even if they do, if you are not able to keep that promise, then that's an area where we can do harm because now they're going to expect to hear from you and they're not, and that's going to make their trauma even more traumatic. So don't make promises you can't keep. We don't want to give advice. You'll see examples of that in a moment. Uh, we don't want to dismiss the problem. You know, oh, you know, you didn't lose your home. You just lost, you know, stuff in your garage. <laughs> um, we might 
say versions of that and not realize it, we want to make sure that whatever problem they have is still very traumatic, depending on whether our judgment is on our in our own heads is, is a problem or not. Or, you know, they shouldn't feel so bad, blah, 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 blah. We want to stay away from that as much as possible. Again, using examples just to paint a picture. Um, focusing on right versus wrong, there really isn't right versus wrong as much in traumatic situations, especially when it comes to how people are feeling. And our job as mental health and psychological first aiders is just to help them, again, regulate emotions, reduce stress, and make them feel safer. Um, don't focus, again, trauma could beget bad behavior or bad habits or trauma. So like focusing on other things that might be stressful to them, weight, food, drugs, alcohol, injury, specific external factors. Um, you know, unless there is an emergency, obviously they're navigating a post-emergency, but we don't want to, you know, focus on things that might trigger other trauma or may not be helpful to their, to their emotional support, emotional help. We're not here to fix, we're just there to be. Um, and engage in communication that is belittling, sarcastic, hostile, or patronizing. Again, it might sound obvious, and we have to really check. You can even think about what you want to say in your head before you say it out loud. I'm saying, if someone was saying this to me and I was in their situation, um, would, I, would I feel that as belittling or sarcastic or hostile or patronizing? Again, we are human beings. We may not be perfect. We aren't perfect. We might say something and really realize that maybe that wasn't the best thing to say, but our here is really about intentions. If we go in with the intention of not being belittling, sarcastic, hostile, and patronizing, and if we go in with the intention of thinking before we're speaking, chances are we're probably going to say the right things or just maybe not say anything at all if that's the right thing to do. All right. So what are some examples of reassuring information versus advice? Um, and I tried to cater this to the situation. Again, these are meant to be kind of extreme just to paint the picture, but you can probably imagine how subtly we might get into advice when we don't intend to. So reassuring information. <sighs> Losing your home and belongings is tough. It's natural for you to be hurt and upset. That is reassuring. It's, it's validating their feelings. Advice might be, I was impacted too, okay? Here's what you need to do. Now, you might feel initially that, that well, you know, I'm align, I'm being sympathetic to them because I was impacted, and I'm telling them what to do. That is not helpful to someone who is navigating trauma, right? Because they, it's about them, it's not about you. Um, if they ask you, so how did you fare? How are you doing? You can share because they, they invited that conversation. But again, that changes the dynamic a little bit. And here's what you need to, you may not know exactly what they need to do. And when folks are navigating trauma, there's an intense, and again, I want to recognize that you are a part of this community. There's an intense loss of control. Um, so much that was in their control is now not in their control. How can we give them support that allows them to be in control? Encourage them to say, hey, there are, there are resources there for you if you need them. And then they can choose to go utilize those resources as opposed to just telling them what to do. It feels like I'm just following directions. I don't have control. Another example. I'm here for you if you want to talk. There are also people who are trained to help you work through these feelings. If you don't know anything to say when you're in a conversation, that might be the perfect, I don't know about the perfect, but a really good two lines to go to. I'm here for you if you wanna talk. I'm here for you, what might you need, something like that. And there are also people who are trained to help you work through these feelings, emotions, um, you know, any other things that you're navigating right now. Advice, you really need to talk to a counselor about that. Again, they, that might be the best route for them, but we want them to own that decision as much as possible. Um, again, if someone is in a really bad situation and maybe hurting themselves, like call 911. Um, but outside of a life-threatening situation, um, how can we focus on that encouragement and that let them make that call? Reassuring information, you're not alone. Now, I want to differentiate because that sounds a little bit like I was impacted too, okay? But it's not. To say you're not alone is reassuring them that they're part of a community. Again, we're not the only one. They may, not, they, 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 may not, they may know intellectually that they were not the only ones affected, but emotionally you feel very alone during these times, or one may feel very alone during these times. To reassure them that they're not alone. There's other people, not only other people that may have been impacted, but other people that care about them, that want to help them. It's a beautiful thing to say. Um, the advice would be, you'll get over this, it's just stuff or property, right? That's the belittling, that's the patronizing. Um, even if we hope that they'll go over this and that we know that our lives are more important than stuff or property, right? Like, 
intellectually we can make sense of that, but emotionally it's not helpful and in fact could be hurtful. Um, at the bear of being a broken record, this is a lot uh, of examples. So if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you're unsure and want us to go over this again, please, this time is for you to put a, uh, something in the chat or to unmute. So even if I go on, if you're like, wait, 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 can you please go over that again or give me another example? Like that's what Jenny and I are here for. Barring that, we'll continue um, and we are coming closer to the end. Um, what, what is our goal, right? We talked about the three uh, guiding principles, but where do we hope uh, folks that have been impacted by trauma end up? And something that Israel Aid focuses a lot on, and I actually think it's a very beautiful thing, is post-traumatic growth. We think of trauma as bad and that we are going down a bad road. Trauma isn't great at all. And how can, once, once the trauma has happened, there's no going back, right? There's no scenario um, where we can go and have the lives that any of us had, or certainly the folks that were directly impacted had on December 29th, 2021 in Boulder. That's just, it's not possible. What is possible is getting to a new, strong, healthy place post the traumatic event. And that's post-traumatic growth. What does that express? That's expressed in five factors. Appreciation of life, uh, a newfound opportunities, uh, a positive outlook, um, new possibilities. Um, again, we wish we never had these fires. We wish we never had COVID. We wish we have never had tragedy. But stemming from that, new possibilities can arise that over time on the long-term recovery process is what we want people to realize and get to. Very, very hard even now. I'm, I imagine emotions and experiences still feel very raw. But over time, um, personal strength relating to others, being able to social, have, have elements, have moments and more than moments of, of um, I don't wanna use the word normalcy, but you know, being able to relate to others and to have part of your life not be about just recovering um, from the fire. Um, and spiritual change. Again, that relates back to that spiritual fitness guide. If I'm you know, going, going uh, forward to a place of being fit um, or mostly in the fit and not in stressed or or more to the right of that um, frame. So it's important that this is all positive terminology. Post-traumatic growth and negative post-traumatic impacts can coexist simultaneously independently. This is not taking away all the negative feelings that individuals have and will continue to have um, well past the period of relief and into recovery. But it's a creation of balance. It's almost like the, the balance, right? We have a, so much negative how do we, through this relief and eventually through long-term recovery, begin to balance ourselves that there's, there's good post-traumatic growth and I'm still gonna have times of challenge. It's not erasing it, it's allowing us to have the tools and skills to navigate it and eventually largely move past it. Um, so, great. Um, there, um, there's a, a question, Jenny, I'm just gonna pause for a quick second because it was just sent to me. How much time is realistic to spend with someone who needs to talk? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think that, you know, it depends. It depends on the person. I think that it can be anywhere from one or two minutes to it could be longer. That being said, if you don't have that time, that is okay. You're part of a community and a team and you can get somebody else or, or bring them somewhere safe to talk to somebody else if need be. But it can go, or you could tell them, realistically, like, you know, I only have five minutes right now, but I, if it's realistic and you can do this, but I'd be happy to follow up with you in an hour or things like that. So I think it really depends on the person in the situation. It could be anywhere from five minutes to, to 30 minutes to an hour. Jenny, thank you. I received uh, another uh, question. Um, we are encountering this trauma nine months after the trauma of mass shooting in Boulder. Um, and thank you for, for raising that. Um, Jenny, any thoughts on how we approach these conversations? I'm using my own language now, um, based on that, that, that comment. Um, we, are, we are responding to individuals as a result of the fire, but also well, you know, the, the shooting is, is just with, within mem recent memory and there's Omicron and COVID. Um, how might we, uh, navigate what we're learning today, given that in mind. 
I mean, I think it really is, um, it is the same. I mean, it's, it's just that being there, being present and hearing what's going on for them. For some people, I think both of those traumas may be affecting them. For some people, it may be one of them. For some people, it may be the other. So I think it really is just acknowledging that it's really challenging and, but really hearing them and hearing what is actually going on for them and what they're struggling with. Uh, Jenny, um, think, saw, yeah, go ahead. I saw, I saw another um, couple, another one in the chat saying, can this be done over phone or Zoom as effectively in person? And I would actually say, yeah, I, I actually do think so. We, we um, because of COVID have been doing therapy via Zoom um, for the last year and a half or so. And, and I would say that um, I think that you really can connect with people um, over Zoom and over the phone. I um, Somebody had asked me um, in the chat about, can this be done through email? And email is a little bit more challenging just because so, so many things can be misinterpreted in email. So I think with email, it's really important to acknowledge someone's feelings if they tell you that they're going through something hard to acknowledge, wow, that sounds really hard. And then repeating back what you're hearing just to make sure that you're on the right track. I'm hearing that you're feeling like you need some help with housing just to make sure that you're actually hearing it correctly. And then um, offering up to people that, um, you know, if, if they do want to transition from email to phone, that may be an easier, an easier step to try to get people what they need. Um, there was a question that came just to me related to that, Jenny. Um, given COVID restrictions where we can't do a visit, would you suggest phone calls or FaceTime or Zoom? Do you have um, recommendations? I think I always think if you can see the person, that's always better if there's a you know FaceTime or Zoom. However, I know for us, there are people who are limited with their technology and that feels very uncomfortable to them. So I think it's really what feels best for the person and what they're most comfortable with. Um, however, if they don't have a preference, I would always try to do one that has something where you can see someone's face just for those little kind of subtle facial cues that maybe you get, you're a little off track with what you're saying or you're not quite getting what they're saying, that, that comes through a little bit better on one's face than it does um, over the phone. But yeah, but anything, but phone is, is, is good too. It's Awesome. And uh, Jenny, I think this came to everyone, but I think this, we're, in, we're in good flow with the questions here. If you offer specific help to a friend and don't hear back from them, I always assume that I need to follow up, but I don't want to invade their personal space. How do you gauge this? Yeah, I mean, I think you, there's, a, there's a fine line, right? And it depends on you may know the person as well. But I always think if you offer the person help and they don't um, respond, just, you can always send an email or a call and say, you know, just want to make sure that you got this. No pressure if you didn't, but just want to make sure you saw it in case you need it. Um, let me know. And then and then I would actually just, just let that go after, after that. You can't, um, I think oftentimes we feel like we know what's best for someone and, um, want them to do it and it may be the best thing for them, but if they're not ready, then you can't force that. But I think mm -hmm. a, I think a, a quick follow-up isn't isn't hurtful or harmful. Yeah, I, 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 uh, Jenny and I and Jay Responders often use the line, I'm here for you, what do you need? Or I'm just sending you a note, them thinking about you, here for you as you need. And you know, but then they, then they can take ownership of coming to you as long as you feel that they're not a risk to themselves, right? I think that's the one yeah. um, thing to think about. Um, but yeah, exactly. Um, it was good timing. Again, bring in the questions, this really wonderful conversation. The balance of this is, is kind of review. I would say I hope this has been helpful. And if you want a two-page shorthand of what do I do and not do, it's the next two slides. So these are the do's of psychological first aid, again, also borrowing from mental health first aid. And I'm just going to read them out loud. Encourage practical suggestions on how people can help themselves. Again, if they have resilient strategies or strategies to help them feel better, uh, perhaps encourage them to think about what, you know, what typically they did. They may not have, you know, gone for a jog or, um, you know, taken really meaningful time for deep breaths or do the things that they know they do self-care. People don't give them themselves the opportunity to do self-care because they're navigating a trauma and they feel like it's not worth the time. But how can we be that friendly encouragement saying, you know, it's important to take care of yourself even during this time too. Um, help people regain their sense of control by engaging them in activities to meet their own needs. So again, giving them that control um, back and encouraging them to think that way. Um, and acknowledge and support the person's strength, competence, courage, and power. Restore a sense of control and feeling that they are resilient. And I think there is a very non-patronizing way to say, you know, you're really strong. Like, wow, like I'm, I'm, I'm uh, inspired. 
um, and just want to acknowledge the courage that you have over the last couple of weeks. I think there's an authentic and kind and a wonderful way to say that, that will help people realize, you know, wow, at a time where I feel so weak, I actually feel really strong. Like, that's, that's wonderful and great. You just got to make sure the tone is right, that it's, it feels sincere and not um, belittling or patronizing, um, which is, again, best to do in person or over, you know, Zoom or even a phone call. Um, where it's less, they can, they can understand the tone better. Um, allow people to determine the kind of assistance they want to receive and the pace of self-disclosure. So if they want to share, great. If they don't want to share, that's okay and that's up to them. Um, ask, have you gotten through tough times before? And though we never wish a trauma, folks that have gone through previous traumas, even ones that might feel very different, um, they, that might be good lessons, you know, after the shooting. Um, this is how I got through that tough time. And even though this is an extremely different circumstance, there might be lessons there that they can take from. Again, we would wish neither of these would have ever happened. Um, but that is, you know, how, how can trauma inform trauma? There are actually um, a lot of um, uh, articles and studies out there of, you know, I survived the hurricane and I'm using those lessons to survive COVID or I survived COVID and therefore, you know, I'm navigating COVID and I've learned these lessons for this, uh, you know, trauma or tragedy as well. It doesn't always, but it's a fair question to ask and that allows them to give control to, to explore ways as well. And ask them encouraged to contribute to the relief operation. As much as they were impacted, they might feel a sense of control and autonomy if they can help somebody else. Um, another do. Again, our number one rule is to do no harm. So what do we want to avoid when engaging with other people? Don't force people to share their stories. If they don't want to share, that's okay. It's up to them. Don't give simple reassurance such as everything will be all right, or at least you survived, or I know how you feel. Uh, might seem obvious because, you know, intuitively we want to say these. <laughs> we want them to feel better. And this is what might initially come up. This is what we want to avoid because we don't know if everything will be all right. Um, at least your survive doesn't give them some curl, it just makes them feel guilty. And how and know how you feel? We don't. We don't know how they feel. Even if we experience something similar, it wasn't the same. Uh, don't tell people what they should be feeling, thinking, or doing. Don't tell people how they should have acted earlier. Um, and again, obvious, but sometimes we want to catch ourselves. Oh, I wish you would have done like not helpful from a psychological first aid emotional perspective, right? Just want to listen and validate how they're feeling now. Don't make promises that cannot be kept. We've talked about that. Don't criticize existing services or relief recovery activities in front of people in need of these services. Again, during times of trauma and challenge, no matter how much we prepare, not every relief and recovery operation is perfect. Um, but we don't want to criticize them because that makes people feel that they're not being helped or not having a sense of control. So. Um, Engage in with those services. How can we make those services better? Um, we want to avoid the criticism and the sarcasm. Um, we mentioned that there's two other parts of algae. There's E and then there's E. So how do we encourage self-help and other support strategies? Um, again, we don't want to tell them, well, I do this, so you should do that. We can say, you know, what helps make you feel better? Um, that might manage these systems. It might be taking deep breaths. It might be going for a walk. It might be, you know, having an outdoor coffee with a friend. It might be those things that, again, they might not be prioritizing right now because they are not giving themselves permission to, and you can help them give them permission to. They need those, they need those rests from um, the work of recovery. Uh, find strategies that interest them. Explore together. Give them options, but again, let them make those choices. Uh, discuss self-help strategies with a health professional. That's kind of bringing in the other E, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And you can share ideas from your own resilience building. What do you do? But only as brainstorming, not as dictating. So you can say, you know, when I'm, you know, in a tough way, these are the things that I do. I'm not telling you to do those things. I'm saying if that's inspiration to you as a brainstorm, then that's okay. And you can be transparent with those that you're engaging with about that approach. So who are the appropriate professional uh, that you can refer people to. We've mentioned some of them on the call and you know JFS and other services include these professionals. So doctors, pediatricians, primary care physicians, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, mental health professionals, especially in this um, realm of this discussion, social workers, licensed counselors, um, 
drug and alcohol specialists, if appropriate, if, if folks are, you know, uh, navigating those, those challenges as well as a result of the fire are connected. Um, school counselors, because uh, you're dealing probably with people of all ages. Uh, if there's food related issues, nutrition experts, peer specialists, um, other professionals, and I'll also mention clergy as well, because I know some are on the call, the folks might be coming to you, or you might be the place where folks like who are not clergy would refer um, individuals to. And again, we're all in this together. It's not a matter of one person helping somebody else out and that's it. We are a team, we are a community, all supporting each other. So if you don't know, then talk to somebody else and say, hey, I had this conversation with somebody. How can I help them? Who can I refer them to? Initial relief, helpful hints. This is just summarizing our discussion. Uh, if you reach out, remember to keep your promises and follow up. Um, do, not do not make promises you cannot keep. Again, intentional that we put this several times in this presentation because we really want to avoid that. Remember what your role is and is not. You're here to provide that band-aid. You're here to provide that initial care. We are not here to fix the problem or to do anything more intensive than we are um, able to do um, because we're not licensed medical professionals. Also, don't put the weight, the world on your shoulders. Do what you can. Anything you're doing, if you're following these guidelines, is doing a world of help. Seek assistance early on. You know, you have folks at the JCC. Jenny and I can be available for questions. Jewish Family Services, there are so many people that can help you as you help others. Um, and you're going to make a world of difference. Um, uh, they say, you know, you save one life, you save the world. You might be saving someone's emotional life and livelihood by doing this work, especially after these rough, uh, this, this rough time. So final review, um, and then I will probably uh, take off the PowerPoint so we can see each other before we close. Focusing on non-judgmental listening, following up with giving reassurance and information. Those are the two things we really want you to come away with. Follow those do's and don'ts. Again, you'll have a slide deck available to you that you can print out. Rule number one, do no harm. If you're going into a conversation, you're like, I, I, I'm not saying the right thing or I'm not gonna say the right thing, to do nothing is better than doing something that could cause harm. Again, if you follow these directions and, and to the best of your ability, you will likely do help and not harm. But no, that's the rule number one. Support the journey towards post-traumatic growth. That's what we're trying to help these folks too, which you know is a long journey ahead. And you're part of a team. Say something and ask for help. You're not putting the world uh, on the shoulders for your conversation and your role is and isn't. So uh, that's my information. We'll share that out separately as well. I'll stop sharing and um, open for questions and gratitude to all of you for joining us here this afternoon. Um, somebody in the chat wrote, um, what is your suggestion if suicide does come up in a conversation? So that is, um, you know, that, that's part of that aid. There's a whole training about that. But um, Mark, do you want me to go into like the asking the question and things like that? Or is that too much for today, do you think? Um, I would suggest uh, if someone, uh, what, what is, it's more than one or two lines, but if like, what's the one thing that they should to know to do if they're encountering with someone that is either contemplating or thinking or showing signs of? Yeah, the thing that you want to know is, um, the, the one or two things is that you want to ask them um, if they have a if they have a plan. And that that's really the most important. And if they have a plan and if they have needs, and if they do, then you definitely want to call a crisis line or or, or crisis intervention specialist or or nine one one. You know, just to make sure. But usually, it's a crisis intervention specialist to kind of come in and take care of it. People can feel overwhelmed. People say things a lot. You know that that does. Just because someone says, oh, I feel like dying or I wish I was dead, that doesn't mean they're going to do anything. It's really, do you, do you have a plan to do that? Um, do you have the means to do that plan? It's really the two most important things. And if, and if those things happen, then, then really get um, intervention immediately. If you hear them say those other things, obviously they, they may need follow-up help in terms of getting resources like a counselor or some of the professionals in the community. But I may not be as emergent as, as if there's a means and a plan. Any other questions, concerns? We're here for you. Um, if you, uh, yeah. Well, I wanna thank Jenny and Mark, and if there are any questions, please put them in. But um, on behalf of all of us in this community, we're so grateful for the two of you to provide this 
really practical um, training that that is, you know, I know that I have been able to use it since we did this training with our staff. And so to bring this to the community is a really important thing. And for all of us to remember that we're there for one another and we don't know all the answers. And there, there's a lot of times where we don't know what the right thing is to say and, and just holding space for families and being able to be present for people is something that's really important. Um, the JCC um, is here for you. Um, all of the synagogues are here for you. Um, Boulder JFS is here for you. Um, we're encouraging everyone to make sure that all people know to get registered at the Disaster Assistance Center. It's a very important thing. It is the countywide support network. And to get into the system, you have to go to um, that site to get registered. Um, some of the things you can actually do online, but some of the things um, you'll do in person. But it is the best way to encourage to make sure that every person does that. Outside of that, there's a lot of other support that's happening. Um, and as people in our community, I know that everyone wants to lend a hand right now. And I know that that's gonna be a lot of time for us to be able to need those hands. Um, so if, if we don't need you right now, there may be a time where we do. And so just remember that this is a marathon um, to be able to really support families and support our community. But right now, um, this idea of talking with people and connecting with them one-on-one -on -one is so important. And Mark and Jenny, your, your um, teaching and um, gift to our community is really appreciated at a time of such need. So on behalf of me and all of us in this community, thank you for taking the time to do this with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And we'll, we'll stop the recording now um, so that if there are any additional